It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Capital One Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Yes. Okay, you know we love to start the show off with you guys, with your questions, and today is no different. So we are going to go straight away to George in Louisville and uh, find out what's on his mind. Hey, George, welcome to the program. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. Nice to talk to you. And you as well. What's up? Thank you. Hey, I had a question for you with regard to whether or not to pay off a mortgage or not. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to provide you whatever pertinent information um, you need to help me with this. But, you know, I understand that, you know, a lot of times paying off a mortgage is sometimes an emotional decision versus a financial or logical decision. And my wife and I are kind of in that decision-making mode right now. And um, just wondering what the, uh, uh, maybe what the, the advice you would provide for, you know, separating the emotional from financial and which one is maybe more meaningful in the long run. <laughs> okay. I, hey, I think a fi- having an emotional decision is okay. It's just a question of whether you can afford to make the f- emotional decision. So tell me, how old are you and your wife? We are in our mid-50s. Okay. And you're still working? Yes, correct. How much do you guys earn together? Uh, combined, it's about 130 140 per year. Great. And um, on that amount of money, are you, you tell me what's happening. You're, you're living well. Are you putting money into retirement? What's going on for you guys? Yeah, we, we live very comfortably. We do everything we want to do. We are contributing to retirement accounts. Um, I work full time and and contribute uh, fifteen, maybe sixteen percent to retirement accounts. Uh, my wife works part time and does not uh, contribute. We kind of uh, pool it together and let mine take care of of those needs. Are you um, wait a second? You're you're putting sixteen percent in. Does that give you? You're not quite maxing out, though, because you're over the age of 50. So you're are you putting in the maximum or not? That is correct. I'm not quite maxing out. You're right. OK. Is there a reason why you're not? Is it, um, you know, or or could you afford to do that? I, I think we could afford to do that. It, it's uh, maybe tied to the same reasons why we're debating the, uh, the mortgage payoff. It's okay. that trying to strike that balance of of living well and living comfortably today and giving what we want to give and doing what we want to give mm. as well as balancing the planning for for down the road. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let okay, so how much have you saved in your um, retirement so far? In retirement, we're at about 550,000 right now. Great. Um and uh, you have other investments as well? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, about another, probably about that much, maybe maybe 600K um, in non-retirement. How is the non-retirement invested? Are you are you doing it yourselves? Are you, is someone um, working, are you working with somebody? Is this like in cash accounts or CDs? Where, where is the non-retirement money invested? Uh, mostly mutual funds. Uh, I've done it myself. Uh, with a with a low cost um, mutual fund company, mm-hmm. um, I've done it myself. It's mostly in uh, moderate risk, uh, some low risk, to uh, j- just for protection. Gotcha. Um, and then then a small amount, maybe maybe ten percent of that is in cash. Okay. All right. So you could pay it off. Are will you be entitled to a pension upon retirement? Uh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just got a no. I got no, ma'am. Um, okay. So it's interesting. If you look at your retirement projections, when do you think you'd like to retire in, you know, 
is it 10 years from now? Is it six years from now? What do you think? Certainly no more than 10. Okay. So um, eight to I, 10. I think, well, you know, that's, and that's something that I've considered getting some help with, uh, you know, from a, from a planning type person. Um, but certainly no more than 10. I would think I, I ideally we'd like to be retired, um, maybe at around the time, uh, 401k distributions and things like that can start happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, the house, how much is the house worth? The house is worth right now about 330, maybe 340. Okay. Um, and I'm judging that based on what similar homes in our area have sold for our, our neighborhood. Okay. How much um, is the outstanding mortgage amount? About 180. Okay. What's the rate on that? Three and a half percent. Oh my God. It's so cheap. Um, yes. It's a 30 year? Yes, it is. And We've you want to stay there? You, you, do you want to stay in the house? Yes, we do. This is a no-brainer. Who wants who wants to pay it off? It's usually one or the other. One of you wants to pay it off. Who who wants to pay it off? Um, I am the one wanting to pay it off. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad I'm speaking to the one who needs a little um, kick in the tush. Don't okay. pay the. Do not pay this off. Do not pay okay. this off. Um, at the le at the very least, do not pay this off while you're still working. It it makes no sense at all. It's such cheap money. And you're investing and gathering money up. And frankly, what you would essentially, what I would like you to do is instead of making an extra payment or paying it off, I want you to max out your retirement account. Uh, okay. That's really more important to me. That's a better use of your income. And you can do $19,500 based on the tax law plus a catch-up contribution of $6,500. So you can put $26,000 into your retirement account. I don't think you're going to get there, but you need. I think putting more money into the retirement account is a much better idea for you than paying off the mortgage. Here's why. Because you need to gather this money in order to bu build your retirement income. When you pay down that house, that money's gone. And it's not going to do anything for you. And you still got the house. That's fine. But there's no reason, there is no reason that I can find in my mind for you to pay this down except for that emotional part. And what I'd like you to think about when you're considering the emotional part is just this. The emotional um, freedom of having more money available to you at retirement is far it's, it's far more important, you'll see why in 10 years, to have that big pool of money. And if, if that is what's most important to you. Now, if for some reason you have uh, an amazing windfall or things are really great and or you decide you're going to work 12 more years instead of 10 years, then you could maybe pay off a little bit later, you know, as you get down the line. But for now, while you're working, no way. Keep saving Add a little bit more to that retirement account. Live your life. Do not think twice about paying this off. I'm going to weigh in. When your emotions are riding high, think about how that freedom of that big account is going to feel. Thank you. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. More of your questions when we return. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, like maybe what's the best investment in a leap year? Just kidding. Don't ask me that question. But if you have a financial question, send us a note. Email us, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if you're poking around the website, which I really encourage you to do, the website is so easy to navigate. It's called jillonmoney.com. You can read all the stuff that I've written. You can listen to past shows. You can watch television segments. You can check out some of the resources that we've accumulated. You can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, which is always a very funny thing, Mark, because it prompts various people in my life to call me on Friday afternoons. They remember all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah, I owe her a call. 
So I always get most of my calls on Friday afternoons, my personal calls. It's a good job. It's all right. All right. Um, let's go and take a call right now from Jerry, who's calling from Michigan. Do you listen to us on Wood Radio in Grand Rapids, Jerry? Oh, no. We uh, stream. All right. Just checking. We, yep. Tell me what's going on, Jerry. How can I help you out? Um, we have got um, I have a question about a Roth conversion. Okay. Uh, my wife and I were both retired, and uh, we have been uh, taking small Roth conversions, staying within the 12% tax uh, bracket. And as I get closer to the age of 72 where we have to start taking RMDs, I got to take took a look at how much the RMDs are going to be, and it's going to jump us uh, quite a ways up into the 22% tax bracket. So I'm wondering whether um, before we hit that time I should start maybe converting uh, some of the IRA money into into a Roth ahead of time. Mm. How much money uh, do you have right now in the uh, deductible um, accounts? Uh, tax deductible accounts. We got about two point two, maybe two point one. Mm. Somewhere there. So that's why, because that big huge amount has to come out. It's a good problem to have. I get it. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, how old are you guys? Uh, both 66. I think that the answer is yes to that. Um, and, and here's why. 12% would be great, but, you know, you're going to jump up and into 22, as you said, as soon as the required minimum distributions start. The other mm-hmm. part of this is that we don't really know where tax rates are going to be in, you know, by the time it's six years has passed, because theoretically you will be sunsetting into the old tax rates. Now, that may or may not happen. I hear, you know, there are some potential ideas about um, allowing or extending these and making these tax cuts permanent. I don't know if that's really going to happen in D.C., but let's let's go just based on the current law, which is the tax law will sunset. Old tax brackets will be put back into place. And then you're not going to be in the 22 percent tax bracket with those required minimum distributions. Your tax bracket's going to jump pretty substantially. So that, to me, argues for converting now at the 22 percent bracket at the very least. And um, and and, you know, as you know, that when you have those required minimum distributions, it's does it, it doesn't give you control over your tax situation. So at the very least, I would want to pay whatever the 22 percent bill is today in the next bunch of years and then. Uh, you, you'll, the, the RMDs will still be there. It just will be a lower amount. And if for some reason the tax law feels like it's going to jump on you, you might even convert even more. You could go up to the 24% tax bracket. But I think that you'll know more information in the next couple of years. So at the very least, I would convert at the 22% bracket. Okay. Great. I guess that's what I was looking for. That's a beautiful thing. Good luck. And I, um, I'm really, I think it's very smart of you to do this. And for those who are listening, what's important to know here is that when you do a conversion, you think, oh, well, I got to pay the tax that's due. You got to have money outside of your account, your, your, the, the, to pay the tax that's due. Now, presuming that that's the case and you do it, then you're really just rolling the dice on where you think tax rates are going to be. But don't forget, you know, when you have a retirement ahead of you, what you may not realize is that a lot of your future costs could be impacted by your taxable income. What am I talking about? I am talking about Medicare. So, when you look at Medicare parts B and D and you've got there's this really weird thing called IRMA income related monthly adjustment amount meaning that if you have modified adjust adjusted gross income that's more than a hundred seventy four thousand dollars for a joint return or 87 on an individual return there's this extra surcharge that pops up and it's not small, okay? So let's let's presume that you're single, okay? And you uh, 
you're going to have required minimum distributions. And, and what Jerry said, his required minimum distributions are going to be taxable as a 22 percent. So let's just say he had, uh, let me see, 22 percent. Maybe it's like, let's just say he's got a hundred thousand dollars of of income, those required minimum distributions. Or maybe it's 125000 Let's just say that if you're married filing jointly and you have uh, you, you get a surcharge of can be anywhere from $70 a month all the way up to more than $400 a month if you've got a ton of income. I mean, look, if you're married filing jointly, you've got $750,000 of income. Of course, that surcharge is going to be real money. But, you know, I point out to people that it's odd, you know, you got, let's say you got $200,000 of income or you're single, you got $110,000, you could pay another $176 a month. So this is one of the reasons that we are really encouraging many of you to look at converting your retirement accounts at current tax rates so that you have more control over your ultimate retirement income. Because you can't really do anything about this once the Medicare IRMA calculation is made. You've got to do it now. So IRMA is the extra amount of money you have to pay for Medicare Parts B and D. Okay? And it's important to really try to address these these issues well before you get to the point where you are in retirement. Now, why do I know all this? Because our friend, friend of the show, Ed Slot, sent me this beautiful Medicare income planning chart. Hey, Mark, should we should we scan these charts in and make them a document that people can check out online in our resource section? Can we do that? I think we should try that. Why don't we try to scan that in and then put a link to it, put a document up, and we'll give Ed the we'll, his copyright on there. Make sure we do that. Let's do that because there's so many great things. There's, you know, he has just the, all the brackets that are there, which is fabulous. He also has the retirement plan contribution limits. He's got this Medicare income planning. He's got the HSA stuff there. And he's got that horrible 3.8% surtax on net investment income. Horrible only because it just everyone forgets about it. So remember, long-term capital gains and dividends. You have a top bracket, not of 20%, but of 23.8%. Remember? There's that. Anyway, I love that idea. Mark, I think you can figure this out. I have great, great, um, I, have, I have great faith. Oh, what does he want? Me? Oh, no, thank God. He wants to talk about the Islanders. Bad game last night. Uh, All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, like Jerry in Michigan, all you have to do is give us a shout. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And we are here to take the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger. Mark is running the show, running my life, running the kitchen. Mark, we could up to open up a new restaurant someday with you being the executive chef and uh, what will I be your sous chef? Maybe that could be a good job. What's it called? Oh, the J O M cafe. I like that, but maybe it's like the M O F like Mark on food, not the Jill on money. This is all about you. The next venture is going to all be about you. I'm going to ride your coattails, my friend, and you're going to be the name out in front of it. Got it. 
All right. Hey, if you are looking for a fantastic way to while away your late February days by the fire, or perhaps by the air conditioner, if you live in the South or the Southwest, why don't you buy my book? It's called The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. And guess what? It's out in paperback for all you cheapskates who didn't buy the hardcover, although you should really buy the hardcover, not because I make any more money, but it's a nice book. Right, Mark? It's like a nice looking book. We did a good job with it. Anyway, check it out. The book is available on our website at jillonmoney.com. All right. Michael writes, I'm 68 years old and I'm considering retirement within the next one to two years. My wife and I would like to look at options for obtaining financial advice before and during employment. Person would have to be a fiduciary, want to hire someone with a broad base of uh, expertise, including financial analysis, planning and management, knowledge of the tax codes, knowledge of social security and Medicare and estate planning. Can you provide advice? advice about how to find some prospective advisors here in our area, which is Louisville, Kentucky. So first of all, hello, Louisville, WHAS, one of my favorite stations. Uh, Okay. So a few things to consider. If you would like a fiduciary, there are two very good options that you can seek. Uh, There is the... uh, NAPFA website, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, napfa.org. That would be a fee-only advisor. And you could check that out. That means you're not going to be sold anything, no commission. It's a pretty clean model, but it's, you know, it's essentially financial advice or financial management. You could also go to the uh, let's make a plan.org website. That is a certified financial planner website. And there are also some advisors that are available through the AI CPA uh, because there are CPAs who have a designation that's called uh, CPA dash PFS. I think it's personal financial specialist. Those are some good options. Also, you may have heard of some services that are, they, they are primarily web or internet-based services, but they add in a financial advice component. And in that respect, there, there are many more options that you could consider. Uh, for example, you could do Vanguard Personal Service Advisor, the Schwab Intelligent Portfolio, there is Betterment, there is Wealthfront, there's this new company that um, we met the some of the folks who started it called Facet Wealth. Those are some of the best places that I would seek. And it seems like you're very clear about your needs. I would also go to our website, jillonmoney.com, because there you will be able to actually grab the, go to the resource section and grab the questions you should ask before you hire a financial advisor. Okay. Uh, Carl writes that uh, I hear your spot every day on KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Here's the issue. I have multiple credit cards totaling about $5,800, and I'd like to combine them all and have just one payment to one creditor. I also have the usual debts. He says mortgage, auto payment, associated utilities. And I have secured a personal line of credit with my credit union a few years ago, but I never used it. What's your opinion about using it to pay off all the credit cards and combining them into this one line of credit? You know, That's not a bad idea, Carl. Uh, I I think a couple of things that come to mind is, you know, why are you in credit card debt? Is this going to be a recurring event where you're going to have to keep doing this? So there's want to kind of get to the root cause of this. But maybe it was a one-off thing. Maybe something broke in the house. Maybe it was a medical expense. I'm not sure. But I think it would be worthwhile for you to really consider you know, what is the best way to pay it down? And if you have the personal line of credit, that is certainly a possibility. Uh, Just know that with the new changes to the FICO scores, that may count against you with your actual score. I don't know how. This is not going into effect till the summer, but it's at least worth mentioning to you. I guess the other part is, the mortgage is the mortgage at a rate that might 
be a level where you would consider refinancing. If that's the case, then that to me could be a really good option as well to combine some of the outstanding debt into one payment. So those are some of the ideas that I would consider, Carl. And uh, I think certainly having a leaner financial life and not making yourself crazy about it and having all these different things is much better. Okay. Tim writes, uh, I want to know what is better, a living revocable trust or a will? Oh, Tim, two different animals. So you, everybody needs a will. Not everybody has a revocable or changeable trust. Um, it depends. A lot of people use a trust or used to use a trust to help with estate taxation. Now that the limits are so much higher, you know, over $11 million per person, it's probably not that, but it, a trust will better control the disposition of your assets. So I think that that's something to think about. You didn't really tell us a lot about your financial life, but as I look at uh, most situations within a state, having a will that that eventually pours over into a trust if you're married, that could be helpful. You may not need a living trust, but they are different documents. And as I always say, your three basic documents for estate planning, that is a will, a durable power of attorney, and a healthcare proxy. Okay, when we return, we're going to get back to more of your questions. But during the break, go to jillonmoney.com and there you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free, ladies and gentlemen. Free, I tell you. So check it out at jillonmoney.com. Okay, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you have a question about your financial life, send us an email. It's so easy to do. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Simple, right? Or if you're poking around the website because you have signed up for our free, make it free, free, free weekly newsletter. Mark just said that people still ask him whether the newsletter is has a fee. No, it's free. Mark, how many people get that newsletter? Just uh, type it. Don't say anything. I, I can I can live with it. Are you busy feeding? You have no idea. Oh, that's a good number. Tens of thousands of people like you are signing up for our newsletter. So, hey, that's so cool. Thank you for doing that. All right. So let us move on because we've got to get through these questions. I am answer Here it is February. I'm answering questions from the beginning of January in our inbox. That's my fault. I apologize. Okay. Here we go. This is a note from Jillian who writes, Citizens Bank lost my traditional IRA. How do I find it? Oh my God. Listen to this. Listen to this. Crazy. Here's the situation. When I was 17, I opened a traditional IRA and deposited money into it for two years. And then I forgot about it. I moved from one state to another. Two years ago, my father, going through his papers in my childhood home, came across my original deposit slips and account number on the IRA. He went to the bank to inquire, and the bank has no records. Gone? How can a traditional IRA, something I am not supposed to withdraw until I am 67, go missing? I've checked all the states I've lived, I've lived in for unclaimed money. I contacted the bank. I contacted support agencies. I asked my financial advisor. I emailed a law office. I sent away for past checks transcripts. I've gotten nowhere. Sincerely, Jillian. Wow. 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 Mark, have you ever heard anything like this? I haven't. Uh, Citizens Bank, I, I wonder, did they sell their investment portfolio or something? I, I wonder if this is like one of those things. Have you not received any? I guess I'm wondering, have you received any statements? And also, when you, you said you sent away for past tax transcripts, is there anything 
Did you, is there a tax deduction? So wait a second, let's think about this, Mark. You go back and you say, I have a deposit slip. So the deposit slip should be, have the year and the date. So you want the tax year that's referenced on that deposit slip and see if you actually claimed a deduction somewhere. But where could this money have gone? It's really curious. It's hard to imagine that it just disappeared. Are you sure that it never got moved into something else that was, um, was the bank merged or was it, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a good answer on this, but now I'm going to do a little research. I'm going to go find out during our break if, uh, I don't think Citizens Bank actually merged with anybody. Hmm. I don't know. Here's another, here's another bad down on your luck story. Nancy writes, we've tried to sell our timeshare in Colorado for more than a decade. Homeowners association fees continue to climb at a ridiculous rate. Remember my mother-in-law's fam- famous line, timeshares are for suckers. That's what she's been known to say. Okay. Back to Nancy. They uh, listed the timeshare with a broker. It's still listed three years later. Do you know of any way to sell a timeshare we no longer want and can't afford? What would happen if we foreclosed or stopped paying the homeowners association fees? We're seniors on fixed income. We can't afford this. We don't want to pass this headache on to our kids. Help with any information. You know, I might just say to the company, we're handing you this back to you. We don't want it. And go from there. Uh, because, you know, it'll probably screw up your credit a little bit, but I bet you have as much credit as you need at this point in your lives. Um, I, I, I always find those services to be a little sketchy, the, you know, listing them, but I would just call the company that owns a timeshare and basically say, we're done. We're off. We're done with this. Goodbye. And have them just, and don't stop paying. And that'll be that. And it'll ding your credit if they report it. If they don't report it, it won't, but still just know that in advance. Okay. Joanne says she and her husband want to open an account for their grandson. They want to put in about 500 bucks. Should it be an UGMA with fidelity? I wanted to stay away from a 529 account. We're not sure about college. What do you suggest? Should we open a Roth for him? He's two years old. Yeah, just open up an UGMA with fidelity and call it a day. That's fine. It doesn't, you don't have to make it more complicated than that. I wonder why you don't want to open up a 529 you know, 529 plans can be also be used for high school if the kid goes to private high school. That's something to think about. Uh, question here about ETFs, exchange-traded funds versus mutual funds. Why don't more fund managers and advisors often ET- offer ETFs? Um, here's the deal. There's ETFs everywhere, and there's mutual funds everywhere, but Um, ETFs are best when you have a big lump sum to make an investment, uh, mutual funds, they do tend to be a little bit easier to add small dollars to, they have fewer minimums. Now with many of these companies simply, um, charging 0% commissions and brokerage fees, I'm sure that you can buy them, but you know, most people just don't need them. They don't need to have a, you know, actively traded fund that is, you know, actively priced fund. So there we go. All right. Another brilliant segment. It's Jill on Money. When we return, more of your questions. If you think of a great question right now, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we close out the hour, we've got a couple more questions that we can answer. Want to remind you that we are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? How about that? All right. Uh, Chris writes, uh, this is interesting. My son is smart. He's 19 in college and puts most of his hard-earned earnings into cryptocurrencies. He's got scholarships, but no savings. 
I've had him talk to relatives and a guy at our credit union. He's lost about $2,000. I'm a single parent teacher. I worry about money all the time. I told him not to ask me for money. Any advice for him or me? Thank you. Mark, do you want to give your two cents about cryptocurrencies? Mark, why did you buy your cryptocurrency? You've started because you were sort of intrigued, right? Yeah, I was sort of like throwaway money. But um, I would say to your son that the history of cryptocurrency um, is that it's a highly volatile asset and that he should be really much more concerned with putting an emergency reserve fund together. But you know what? He's 19 years old. So if he's going to be dopey, let him be dopey. You know, you can't, you can't save people from themselves sometimes. Just ask me, please. Uh, okay. Betsy says, I transferred funds from one institution to another a while back. Can I throw out the paperwork from the transfer? Or should I keep it? Keep it. Keep your, keep the paperwork, keep the paperwork, please. Uh, especially for, at least for a few years. Okay. Because I don't trust sometimes that things are going to get done properly. In general, I like to, to remind people that if you could just keep some of that IRA, Roth IRA paperwork, uh, to make sure you know where the funds come from, source of funds, just keep everything that way, if God forbid anyone comes back and is looking for some information, you've got it. Generally speaking, after you file your taxes, I always say to people, like, after six years, you can get rid of your tax returns, but just be careful, please. Okay? That's good. All right. Good news. Good news for you, gang. We have a whole nother hour. So what does that mean? It means you get to, like, kind of take a stretch, stand up if you're listening at your computer. Don't stand up if you're driving. And during the break, go check out the website, jillonmoney.com, and check out our resources. A lot of people asking what questions to ask your financial advisor. It's right there for you under the resource section. Just hop on to jillonmoney.com, and we'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You are back. It's hour number two of Jill on Money. We're broadcasting from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. You know who should have gone to Policy Genius, Mark? My nephew who was renting an apartment here in New York. And for some reason, Mark and I were talking about this, that um, he didn't have renter's insurance. And uh, you know what happened next? There was a fire. And so he's not getting any of this stuff covered. But Mark and I were talking about how we were under the impression and so with most cases that people who are renting apartments, that landlords, maybe it's big rental agents, usually require rental insurance. I had this conversation, of course, being the annoying certified financial planner in, in the family. I say to my sister, how could he not have insurance? She goes, you know, I, I dropped the ball. I said, you didn't drop the ball. This kid's in his 20s. It's time for him to uh, step it up and be responsible. And she says, well, now he's going to have to replace all this furniture. I said, well, then that's going to be a good lesson. He'll never go without insurance again. Anyway, check out policygenius.com. We've got a great guest this hour. It was a delight to meet Lee Hartley Carter. She wrote a book called Persuasion, Convincing Others When Facts Don't Matter. And I really, uh, I, I have to say, I went into this interview thinking it wasn't going to be great. And it was way, way better than that. It was fantastic. Here's our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where'd you grow up? All right. I grew up in New Jersey. I've um, heard of it. It's the Garden State. It is the Garden State. With a really and bad mass transit. Really, <laughs> really bad mass transit. And also, Garden State, they do have amazing tomatoes and amazing corn, and no one really knows that about New Jersey. Oh, all right. Well, so. okay. Yeah, Jersey corn earlier in the season. I'm a Long Island corn person. We do later in the season. There you go. Okay. So you grew up in New Jersey, 
and you go off to college. What did you study? I studied history and sociology. I always had a passion for language. Um, at the dinner table, I would always ask questions like, what do you think the difference is between a nerd, a geek, a dweeb, and a loser? They sound like they're the same thing, but each one very different visual in your mind. Um, so the power of language and messaging always played big in my life. I always loved reading. I always was passionate about about words, and I was also passionate about politics. Um, and so that sort of informed a lot of my early life that then led later to me switching careers to do what I do now. Okay, so talk about the politics stuff. Were your parents political or no. were, not at all? No, my parents... What did your folks do? My mom was a stay-at-home mom. She's an artist. Um, and my father uh, was in the electronics business, so not a political family at all. My grandparents much more politically involved and engaged. I have a great grandfather who's a congressman. So it maybe skipped a few generations. And I um, I was always passionate about it. I was a total geek about politics when I was in high school, the kind of person. Like how? What'd you do? I was the chairman of the Young Republicans of New Jersey. You know, that oh kind of God. person. I know, oh I know. And I have God. to admit that living in New York. So yeah, and live by that. So what is it about politics that intrigued you? You know, so much of politics is about messaging. You can be inspired and raised to the, you know, to the heavens by a, a great speech. And I grew up under, you know, Ronald Reagan was president when I was young. And I just used to feel so proud to be an American when he spoke. Then you saw the divisiveness, but I also just really the power of, of speech, the power of leadership, so much about it appealed to me. And I also, uh, it, it was a form of a way to connect with others too, by talking about it, having conversations about it, debating it. Um, and it used to be that we had debates about these kinds of things when we were younger, not even when we were younger. It used to be that you had debates about politics in general, and it was we might disagree on tactics, but we both want what's best for the country. And that's that's really faded, and that's sad to me. The part of persuasion, which I found interesting as you lay it out, is that there is almost a science that you talk about mm -hmm. in, in a process that you help your clients, but also anybody, really understand that this begins with having an appreciation for where that other person is coming from and empathy. And so why is that so important in the world of persuading? So most often when we're trying to persuade, we, we just think about what we want to say. We create an objective. We say, this is what I want to accomplish. I want people to hire me. I want people to vote for me. I want people to buy my product. And here are all the reasons why somebody should buy my product. They never really slow down and say, what does that other person that I'm trying to talk to need? Where are they coming from? What do they feel about this issue? What do they feel about this product? What do they feel about anything? Why do they feel that way? Without doing that, you're going to just start giving a laundry list of facts, a laundry list of proof points, and you're going to be speaking in some ways just right over the head of the other person until you stop and slow down and say, where is this person coming from? Because it's only once you get to that other person's mindset that you're really going to be able to change hearts, minds, and meet them where they are. And you write, whomever it is you need to persuade, be it the city council or your in-laws, in a way that truly resonates, makes you matter, Know your customer without judgment, without snark. And you say the golden rule of communicating, talk to your audience as they are, not as you want them to be. Can you give us an example of like the difference between those two ways of thinking about it? I've done a lot of work um, in financial services, for example. Oftentimes people will develop a financial product and they'll have this really technical idea on why it's so important. So let's just talk about variable annuities, for example. Let's, God, I Everybody. hate them. I hate them, and everyone in the insurance industry hates me for hating them so much. Okay, and that's fair. So we can, <laughs> <laughs> but, but a lot of people would go out there and say, let's talk about guaranteed income for life because that's the benefit. That's why we built these things, right? But the truth of the matter is people aren't sitting out there saying, you know what I wish I had? I wish I had guaranteed income for life because most people in retirement aren't thinking about an income anymore because they already have their pool of money. That's not the way they think about the what they're looking for. What they're looking for instead is protected growth. They want their money to grow and they want protection and they want to know that it's going to be there for them when they need it. So we helped our clients in the variable annuity industry say, let's stop talking about it as guaranteed income for life, which is what everybody was talking about. Instead, let's talk about protected growth strategies. And now that's largely taken over the industry. And the difference between it is one is speaking about the benefit of the product to the insurer. This, we developed it for guaranteed income for life. The other is what is the person looking for? What is the person who's investing looking for? And what they're looking for 
is protected growth. Of course, but they don't know that it comes with a fat fee that they'll be paying forever and that they could do it in another way. They could do it in another way. I think the thing that they also, some people are, are willing to make that trade off. True, that the fees true, are, true. I don't want to have to worry about it. Right. So that's, I want to pay someone to worry so that I don't have to exactly. worry. All right. I got that. That's fair enough. Let's talk about empathy and persuasion. Let's do it like on a micro level. In the book, I talk about this whole thing about emotional empathy. It's built on the change triangle. The change triangle basically says we have positive emotions that serve us, a biological function, and then there's these inhibitory emotions. Those are shame, anxiety. And shame and anxiety will keep us from doing anything productive. So if you put somebody either into shame or into anxiety, so you can fact them by shaming them and say, like, you, you don't know this, this isn't absolutely true, or you can start giving them facts on how much trouble they're going to be in if they don't start investing now or if they don't do things differently. Those two things are going to make people defensive and not do what you want them to do. What you want to do instead is put them in emotions that are make them biologically want to do something. So you get some people angry and they're going to say there's a problem I need to solve, but don't put them in shame or anxiety and there's a difference. Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Lee Hartley Carter in just a second. Hey, did you know that my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs, is actually out in paperback? So check it out. You can go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click on the link that says the book. You can buy it from whatever bookseller is exciting to you. All right, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And uh, I was thinking, like, what's going on this weekend? And then I realized that for a lot of parents, this is the last weekend before your maybe your inter, your midwinter break is over. So don't worry. They're going back to school soon. Back to your real life. Have you started tackling those taxes yet? Might be a good time to focus on that. We'll have more on that throughout the month. Don't worry. All right. It's time to go back to our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. She's written a book called Persuasion, Convincing Others When Facts Don't Matter. And in this segment, we're talking about the importance of storytelling. And that is one great way to convince others about what's going on. So here's our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. So now let's talk about the story part because you talk about empathy and we do a lot, you do like a deep dive into empathy. Mm -hmm. And then you also bring storytelling into it. And you say that the visual markers and storytelling become incredibly important in the art of persuasion. How so? Our minds don't necessarily remember facts in the same way that we remember stories in the same way that we remember visuals. And they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, all of these kinds of things. With persuasion, what you want to do is create a lasting impression. It takes a while for us to change somebody's mind. So you want to have something that's going to stick. When you wrap data in storytelling, it just allows us to sit with it, to think about it. And it creates sort of a, almost like a mnemonic structure for us to remember things in. Likewise, Visuals are so important. And that doesn't necessarily even mean you have to have a clear picture, but I talk about the power of visual language and even symbols. So if you think about, for example, Starbucks years ago when Howard Schultz first came back, the first time he came back to reset Starbucks, they had lost their way. A lot of people complained about the quality of the coffee. They said it tasted burnt. It wasn't as good as it used to be. He came back instead of saying, I'm back and we're going to have better coffee again. He said, I'm back and I'm going to close the doors of every Starbucks for an afternoon and we're going to teach every barista to make the perfect cup of coffee. There was something very visual and symbolic and symbolic gesture that's really powerful and really lasts with all of us much longer than if he just came back and said, I'm going to make, you know, restore the quality of our coffee. Likewise, you see this in politics. Donald Trump didn't say he's going to get tough on immigration. He said he's going to build a wall. You know, Elizabeth Warren right now, she's out there talking about she doesn't have a million policies out there. Her whole thing is she's got a plan for that. I've got a plan for that as a T-shirt. And that becomes her own sort of symbol of creating wonkiness into a in, into a symbol. And so I think when we can try and find ways not just to talk about your policy or your point of view or your product, but to create a visual or a symbol, it allows us to really connect with it in a different way. How important, you know, you talk about authenticity mm. in your book. You know, we always talk, hear about that in the workplace. Like, bring your authentic self to work. I'm like, you don't want my freaking authentic self on the television. Thank you very much. You want a part of that. You don't yeah. want the whole thing. 
So can you talk a little bit about why that's important in the idea of communicating in general? We all have weaknesses. We all have strengths. We are most connected to things that we love the good and the bad of them. If there is a weakness that you have, if there is a, you know, a fatal flaw, if there is an elephant in the room, acknowledging it, embracing it, making it part of your narrative, I think is more powerful than ignoring it. I think that we don't necessarily love the perfect anymore. When you see something that's too perfect, we don't believe it or we don't trust it. And so oftentimes now, I think some of the best communicators and the best persuaders, frankly, own their flaws. I think about Hillary Clinton when she was running for president. There was an authenticity gap, I would say, in who she was. But there were a couple moments during her campaign that I thought were so breakthrough for her that I wish she had done more of. She was asked a lot about how how it felt to be criticized or all of these different things. And she always said, well, I don't listen to my critics. I don't listen to my critics. And then there was one moment, and I think it might have been with Stephen Colbert. I'm not exactly sure who the interview was. But she said, you know what? It hurts my feelings. It really hurts my feelings and it's hard. I try to tune it out, but when I can't, it's just, it's terrible. I just thought, wow. Where is that person? Where is that person? Um, She also did an interview with Ellen DeGeneres. She was wearing her blue pantsuit and this little girl came out and wanted to, she said that when she grew up, she wanted to be president of the United States. And Hillary gave her a little blue pantsuit. And the little girl came out wearing this plant suit with pearls. And (laughs) it was like the best thing because it was totally just embracing who she was and not running away from it, trying to make it something else. And I think those are the moments when you have that real authentic connection that creates a a real powerful um, dynamic between us. And that's what you're looking to have happen. Tell us about what you do right now for a living in the company and so that people know where you're coming from. Yeah. So my company is called um, Ms. Lansky and Partners. We are what we call a language strategy company. And our whole philosophy is it's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. So our job is really to help companies and associations communicate more effectively on the issues that matter most to them. This isn't about putting lipstick on a pig. These are companies that have good products, good services, good things to say. We're just trying to help them say it in a way that's going to matter and make things, you know, have the impact that they should have. In addition to that, I also am out there talking to voters, trying to understand what's resonating and why. So in the 2015-2016 election cycle, for better or for worse, and regardless of how this makes you feel, the research that we did predicted that Donald Trump was going to be the nominee on the Republican side and then ultimately president. And now um, in this election cycle, I'm doing the same thing on the Democrat side. And so do you get paid for doing that research or you guys are just doing it for like the heck of it and it's kind of cool? So I don't get paid by any politician and we don't get paid for the political work that we do. I think that what we believe and what I believe strongly is it helps us understand the zeitgeist. It helps us understand what's out there and how people are feeling in general. And that only helps us be more effective because, as I've been talking about, one of the most important parts of our job is to understand people, why they are the way they are, why they feel the way they feel, why they believe what they believe and why they do what they do. And this is definitely something that helps us do that. So that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was not for pay. And so um, when you go on various television outlets to discuss this, you're just saying this is your proprietary research and that's what you found and that's illuminating and all of that, right? right. Okay. Now, question about the clients. Do you turn clients down when you're like, ugh, that's a gross business. I don't want to do that because you're a private company, right? Yes, we do. So what is the metric by which you decide not to take a client? So we will not take a client that our values don't align with. And, you know, my company, despite the fact that I was the chairman of the Young Republicans, I would say 98% of my company's Democrats at this point. Um, So if their values don't align with our values, we won't take on a a project. And we also give our team, if there's something that's controversial, we give our team the right to say, you know, how they feel about it. Um, But for the most part, we don't, um, we don't get involved in anything related to tobacco. We don't get involved in anything related to guns. We don't get involved in anything related to abortion. And then there's some other things along the way that we've had to make decisions on that say this just isn't right. There's also some companies along the way that we've said, you know what, this isn't necessarily the kind of company that we want to be involved with. So when you're thinking about a crisis management, because you've got an interesting chapter about that, and it made me think a lot back to financial services. Tell me what you thought about the financial service industry in general, the response to the financial crisis, grade their performance. In the in the immediate aftermath, I would give them an F. But this is what happens in crisis. I always say our first instincts at crisis are absolutely wrong mm-hmm. because we're defensive. Mm-hmm. And so instead of trying to get why everybody in the world was so upset, which 
we were all so upset because everything trust crumbled in a you know in a day everything we trusted was gone the bailout money needed to be given out people were angry and instead of individual companies saying you know what we understand why you're so upset we understand trust been broken they're like it wasn't me those guys were worse than i was <laughs> yeah. it was a few bad actors over here instead of acknowledging like wow you guys lost your whole retirement savings overnight it doesn't matter who was responsible it was the industry as a whole people were upside down and nobody was acknowledging it we were doing focus groups with investors and they were so angry and the people the executives in the in the banks and the financial institutions that we're working with were like but don't they understand that we actually paid back the fail out money i know that was the funniest response ever we paid everything back with interest the government made money on us. Yeah, we were the first ones to pay back that money. It's like, well, who cares? So so you've already made so much money that you can pay it back. My stock portfolio hasn't recovered yet. And it took a long time for people to, to gain trust back. And it's still not there. It still comes out when you're talking to investors sometimes. They're, they're burned. Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Lee Hartley Carter in just a second. Hey, during the break, why don't you go to our website, jillonmoney.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. I want this newsletter to break through a certain number by the end of 2020. I'm hoping you'll get us there. It's free. It's weekly. It's great. Mark puts it together. Great content. So check it out. Go to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Just go to jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and uh, we're finishing up our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. She is the author of a book called Persuasion: Convincing Others When Facts Don't Matter. And she has such an interesting personal story in this book. Uh, I think many of you who are listening have been uh, part of these 360-degree reviews at work. And it's interesting to understand what do other people think of you and learn about that. Because remember, everyone has a master narrative. Are you going to own yours or are you going to let others own yours? So here's the rest of our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. The truth of the matter is whether you own your master narrative, not you have one. Because all decisions about us are made when we're not in the room. And so when you're not in the room, what do people say about you? You want to know what it is and you want to help shape it and define it. Can when you tell that story about getting your um, 360 back and what that what that felt like and tell oh. that as like the, the narrative is established whether or not you like it or not? Yeah. So a few years ago um, at our firm, we did 360 reviews, which allows all of your peers to give feedback on how you're doing. I wanted to know how I was doing. I was hopeful that I was going to get to the next stage of my career. At the time, I was a partner in my firm, but I wasn't in a leadership position beyond that. Um, and I wanted to get the next step. And so I got this feedback and I was hopeful um, that I would get some good feedback that could help me be a better leader. The feedback that I got was that people viewed me as a leader, but not a very good one. Um, and that was really tough, I think, in large part because people viewed me more as a friend than a leader. And mm -hmm. that's a leadership style that's very dangerous. When you're too close to friendship, you can't be a good leader. So that was one thing, and that surprised me. The second thing is I am very good at getting new business. But the, the downside to that was that many people um, had thought that I was using my looks to get new business. That that's was so really, weird. That came back as a 360 it feedback. Did. And this was pre-Me Too. Well, I'll tell you in a second why, what, where I, where I got to that and where it came from. And the third piece was at the time I had been going through some fertility related challenges and I had been out of the office a bunch. Mm -hmm. And so people had been filling in those gaps by saying, she's not present. She's a slacker. They didn't know where I was. I always tell people if you're anything that's left ambiguous is going to be interpreted negatively. That's mm -hmm. just the way it goes. Right. So those are the three pieces of data. It was really tough feedback and I was heartbroken. I would cry. I'm like about to cry right now because I'm like sitting in your shoes and saying how hard that must feel. That to feel like that from your colleagues. Oof. Yeah. I almost couldn't go back to work. I, I hear you. I, I went home. My CEO gave me the feedback and he said, I just want you to know this is going to be really tough, but I've got your back. And I think if he hadn't done that, I might not be here today. Like it was, mm -hmm. it was so heartbreaking. And I had a decision to make. I say either I've got to get curious about what this is all about or I've got to go find another job. But things can't stay the same. And I cried. I 
thought about quitting. I thought about reaching out to headhunters. I didn't know what to do. And then I thought, no, I love what I do. Mm. I've got to be able to turn this around. Mm. This has got it. Let me look into this. What What is this feedback all about? The first one about leadership style is like, you know what? You're right. I've got to stop being friends with everybody. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Because if I want to be a leader, I got to send myself home before everybody gets drunk at happy hour. And I've got to start doing things a little bit differently. The second piece, and that, that was really difficult for me, the, the piece about using my looks for um, new business. And then I started thinking about it and I said, you know what? There was a client who in front of my colleagues asked me to go up to his mini bar for a drink while we were all out. And then there was another client who hit on me in front of others. And then there was another client that touched my face in front of people. It was really bizarre stuff. Mm-hmm. They were all sort of similar kinds of people. And so there became a joke at the company. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to deal with it besides make a joke out of it. Because I thought it was right. like, what that, do you do? Hello, that's what we used to do. We'll you just, made a joke out of it or else you would be called like, uh, you, you're so, oh, don't get your, uh, you know, you're so sensitive. Yeah. So then there was this ongoing joke. A new client would come in and they'd be like, oh, that's what Elise. And I would be like, ha, ha, ha. And so I realized that it became part of my narrative. It became mm. the thing that people were saying about me. And it was a joke, but it wasn't funny. And then the third piece was I understood why people, if you don't see someone there all the time, you don't know where they are, got to do it. So got in front of everybody and I said, listen, I got your feedback. I want you to know I love it here more than anything and I'm committed to turning it around. And I heard three major themes. Here's what they are. I repeat them back. I said, one, you view him as leader and not a very good one. And that's going to change. You want me to do more thought leadership. You want me to be more of a leader. That's starting now. Number two, I heard what you said about new business and it breaks my heart because I'm really good at what I do. And for you to think that I use my looks to do anything related to it makes me sick, but I get it. I said, I have thought a lot about it and I heard what you said. I'm going to ask you to join me in never making a joke again Mm -hmm. about a client hitting on me. Mm -hmm. I've made the jokes. You've made the jokes. That stops today. We're done. Anybody ever does it again, I will stop you in your tracks because it is wrong. It is unambiguously wrong. And I will reject it, and it is no longer acceptable here. And the third thing is, I need you guys to know that I had a surgery. It went wrong, and it's been really hard for me. And I should have told you, but from now on, I'm going to put it on my calendar, all of my doctor's appointments, and you'll know where I am without without any question. Mm. And that's where I've been. And outside of those doctor's appointments, I will be here and I'll be present. It was a reset moment. It changed everything. And within a year and a half, it really, really turned the corner. That's but great. But well, that's of- hard. So hard, but that's the power of, I think, authenticity and vulnerability and all of these things that are so important to Mm -hmm. persuasion. I think, and that goes back to the point in crisis communications, acknowledging people's concerns and owning them. Yep. And if I didn't, it never would have changed. When you see like a big, uh, something like the Equifax data breach or the Mm -hmm. Wells Fargo fiasco, what do you think is the, what is the CEO's job in that moment to say, Buck stops here. It's me. What should be happening? Because it feels like not enough happens in that moment or something like sort of ham handed happens. But then, you know, the guy loses his job, you know, after being under hauled under the congressional subcommittees. Like, what is it that should be going on in that crisis management? I think the thing that happens the most, which is the most unfortunate thing, is that the lawyers take charge. Yes. All messaging, all actions, all everything gets lawyered to death. Lawyers are important, but the bottom line is there's a a financial risk associated with legal risk. There's not necessarily a financial risk that they see today that's associated with communications risk. Mm. And so communications gets so watered down in those moments that we have no idea what to believe. We have no idea what to think. People are afraid to apologize. They're afraid to own it. They're afraid to say that it's never going to happen again. They're afraid to talk about the actions that they're taking. So we're just looking at this blur and say, wow, that sounds awfully legalese. And I'm afraid that they're not doing the right thing by me. Thanks so much to Lee Hartley Carter. The book is called Persuasion, Convincing Others When Facts Don't Matter. And we are convincing you to take control of your financial life. The only way you can do that, well, there's lots of ways, but one way you could do it is to send us an email. Just Give us a little jingle. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. 
you're back. It's Jill on Money. And we are the show that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And things are always very mysterious around tax season. We understand that. I, I saw a recent study that found that people are basically apoplectic around taxes. I don't know why. Nothing's changed really from last year. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, more to the point, it's it's more, I think that we are creating barriers that are just unnecessary. All you have to do is just plow through it. Most people will be claiming the standard deduction, about 85, 90% of people. So, you know, stop doing a number on yourself. Okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, let's get through some emails here. This is a note from Joe who's interested in establishing a revocable living trust. He says to take the place of my will. Joe, let me stop you right there. Uh, a revocable living trust does not take the place of your will. It exists alongside the will. You still must have a will that's drafted. Okay. Um, and the reason is the will will take care of your personal property. The trust can take care of your assets that are placed in the trust, but you still will need a will. Okay. So going on to Joe, he says, I'm single. I've got three children um, who are 39, 25, and 20, who would be the beneficiaries of the trust. Most of my assets are in IRA. Oh, interesting. So just so we're clear, if most of your assets are in an IRA, you don't do, you don't need a living trust. There's no reason to necessarily make these big changes if someone's a beneficiary of an IRA, right? Because the IRA will dictate that. But wait, there's a complication. Because the two younger children, he wants their inheritance spread out over time in thirds or quarters, perhaps every five years. And the question really is, can my revocable living trust be the beneficiary of my IRA? Yes, but it's not ideal. Let me start with that. Why do you want to do this um, This thirds or quarters? I, I don't know. The problem is that I guess that I don't know how a trust, uh, if the trust is the beneficiary of the IRA, first of all, the assets have to be pulled out of that IRA uh, within 10 years if the kid's in inherit it outright. I don't know if that's the same rule if the trust were to, but it's only a 10-year period that you could possibly do it. If you have the IRA um, and the beneficiary is the trust, there's a tax implication that may not be great. What I would do is this. I would talk to an estate attorney and maybe what I would do is just leave the kids the money outright. I, I'm not sure what you're trying to do. Are they irresponsible? Um, you know, chances are if they were to pull all that money out of the IRA quickly, it would be a tax event anyway. So I wonder if we could have a conversation with your kids whereby we explain how the IRA works and why it's beneficial to them not to actually yank the money out all at once. But I, I'm just wondering if this could actually be solved with a conversation with these adult children. Let me know what you think. Mary writes, uh, she wants to know my thoughts on the enormous debt issues um, that linger here. Um, and so she says, the overnight lending to Wall Street traders by the Fed is concerning to me. Don't be concerned. The Fed knows how to do this. It's a function of the, the previous LIBOR rate basically getting ditched because of a scandal. But it, I don't think you need to really worry about this. But she also writes, in conjunction with the tax giveaway to the wealthy and corporations, doesn't seem like a rosy picture going forward. I'm close to retirement. The thought of another meltdown just when I'm ready to retire is uncomfortable. So I think, let me read between the lines. What I think you're actually asking, Mary, is like what you should do. I myself am not worried that all of a sudden there's going to be another financial meltdown. Will there be another bear market between now and the time you die? Yes. So how do you actually think about that? Well, if I were looking at retirement and I was worried about the financial markets, I might just trim my allocation 
maybe you've got too much risk in the stock market right now. Maybe it would be better for you to reconsider that allocation and stick to a more conservative approach over the next group of years. But there's no way to avoid the next downturn. The next downturn will come. How you can prepare for it is very simple. You make sure you've got your consumer debt paid down. You make sure you've got a healthy emergency reserve fund, a year of expenses before you retire. You make sure that your allocation is more in line with what your retirement needs are. So I don't know exactly what's going on in your retirement, but I think that that's certainly something that is worth considering. I think that if you do make any sort of change, please, please, please know that you may be wrong. It may be the good times roll on for a long time and you miss out on the upside. As long as you're okay with that, then you can change your allocation. I would really be careful to start to, before I start making any sweeping changes to my accounts. Okay. So good luck, Mary. Anyone else who's worried, I've been getting a few questions like this um, about is the market at the top? I mean, I don't know. I, who knows? No one really understands the best time to get in or out. Otherwise, they'd have a crystal ball. and That doesn't seem to work so well. If you've got that same concern or a financial question of any type, feel free to give us a ring or a drop us a note, I should say. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And during the break, head on over to the website, JillOnMoney.com, and you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free. Go get it. Okay, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on money. Let's squeeze in a couple, maybe one more question. I'll see if I can get to two before the end of the program. As a reminder, we are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. Very easy. Uh, All right. Ron sent us an email. Uh, He said he's a question about how changes to retirement plans will affect his wife's inherited IRA. So this is part of the SECURE Act. And remember, this was passed right at the end of December. You may have missed some of the nuance of this uh, new act, but there are some changes to the way the rules of retirement and inheriting IRAs is one of those rule changes. So My wife inherited an IRA from her late mother several years ago, and she has been taking required minimum distributions as required based on her own life expectancy. So that was the old rule, which is you could stretch out those distributions over the course of the beneficiary, the the non-spouse beneficiary's life. So that works pretty well, right? Okay. Now the rules change. It says if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, you've got to take the money out within 10 years of the decedent's death. So question from Ron is, will the new rules affect those who are already taking required minimum distributions according to the old rules? No, you're not affected. Isn't that great? So you're grandmothered or grandfathered in. And the good news about that is your wife can keep doing exactly what she has been doing. For anyone who inherited an IRA and the person and and non-spouse and the person died before January 1st of 2020, the old rules apply, meaning the distributions that come out of that account, those distributions can be stretched out over the course of your own life. But for anyone else, if you inherit an IRA account and you are Uh, a non-spouse, now, if that person has died after 2020, you got to get that money out within 10 years. Okay. We're going to talk a lot more about that SECURE Act. We'll have a special episode coming up. It is Jill on Money, and we are delighted that you joined us for this program. We are here every single week. If you miss any part of this show, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com, and click on the Listen tab, and you can hear all of it. Thanks so much for listening. 